We're going to be on page 282. We're in the fourth chapter, the fifth Mishnah, at the bottom of the page, the bottom of 282. Uh, for those following at home, hi, Mom, how are you? Uh, we're at the bottom of 282. Uh, while you're finding your, uh, your place, there's a couple of announcements in addition to letting everyone know that we do have a minute and afternoon service here at 105 if you'd like to join us. We have several flyers advertising some upcoming programs, uh, kicking it off, at least I believe on Sunday night. Uh, you didn't know that pizza is a traditional Hanukkah food, did you? <laughs> pizza. Pizza, it is here anyway, New Sakharit. So, so uh, Ah, jelly donuts, jelly donuts, and we're going to have a drawing for some kids, some prizes for some kids as well. Uh, so for kids six and under, so if you know any, any kids, children, grandchildren, you can go out and uh, bring them, borrow some, rent some, bring them over. We're going to have a nice time with, with some kids for pizza night. That's on Sunday. Uh, Cineplex is on the 14th. You can see the, the schedule of that. And every Shabbos, of course, we have special programs. Starting Points, Wisdom for Living, uh, the session on... Saturday morning on Shabbos morning, we'll speak about miracles. So Hanukkah is a good time to talk about miracles. So da daily miracles and do you believe in miracles? That topic will be what we'll be talking about there, as well as some other things you can see advertised. So um, let's take a look at our lesson for today as everyone's getting settled. And we're on the bottom of page 282. So the Mishnah says the following, in the name of Rabbi Yishmael ben Rabbi Yossi, that's the rabbi of the day, he says the following, he who studies Torah in order to teach is given the opportunity to study and to teach. Mm -hmm. But he who studies in order to practice, turning the page, is given the opportunity to study and to teach, to observe and to to practice. And we're going to pause there, at least in terms of our lesson for the day. So, so the question that the Mishnah talks, touches upon today, uh, it's an idea that I think is relevant to all forms of, of reading. Does anybody still read these days? I think there's some, some people yeah. who read. Uh, not, just, not just the comic books, but there's people who read out there. Uh, so it touches upon anyone, anyone who reads, anyone who studies, certainly present company included. So the question here is, and again, it's an idea that I think that we can explore beyond the immediate topic of the study of Torah, but we'll focus in on and differentiate the various types of motives that one can have and the ones that are appropriate for the study of Torah compared to other forms of wisdom, other forms of learning, all of those other things study, whether it be fiction, nonfiction, etc., is what is the proper motive to study Torah? or to make the question a little bit more personal. Why are you here? Why are you here? You're not here for lunch today. <laughs> it's a lunchtime class, but it's not lunch. So nobody can, no, nobody here can be accused of coming for the excellent food. So the question, not even of course as much today, but the question, whenever we find ourselves engaged in the study of Torah, whenever we're, we're studying Judaism, whenever we pick up a Jewish book, whenever again, expand this beyond the area of Torah. Whenever we study anything, why are we doing it? And that question may be a question that's so basic to the question that we never thought about it. Or at least we don't think about it often. Now's the time. Now's the time to think about, about why we're here and when we study Torah, why we study Torah. So Mishnah, our lesson for the day, states both, both explicitly and implies that there are three possible reasons a person can study anything, certainly when it comes to Torah. So I'm going to go through these three reasons, those three, uh, three approaches to the study of, of Torah, and we'll see what are what are optimal, what gets the gold star, uh, what gets the, the silver star, what gets the bronze medal, if you ask. Well, the first level of studying, and this is an idea that's implied, one without a promise of divine assistance or reward, because we see in the Mishnah, that there are two attitudes or two perspectives that are shared. You can study in order to teach, and you can study in order to do. But there is a third form of motivation, which we'll look at first, and that is a person who's studying just because. A person who studies just because. So what does that look like? What, what, what is the scenario behind an individual 
who's reading, who's studying, a person who's learning just because. It perhaps happens uh, on occasion even with us, whether it comes to one or other areas. Um, common goal or the common denominator among the few examples that I'll share with you is that there's no end goal. Studying without a goal. Learning without a goal, or at least one that's anything above and beyond entertainment. So, if anyone reads before they go to sleep at night, so maybe your goal is to read just to be able to relax. Maybe just pass the time. Uh, it could be that it's entertaining. Why do people go to movies? Why do people go to films? It's entertaining. Okay? I'm not saying that, uh, that there's anything wrong with that, but we're talking about various motivations underlying the things that we do. Could be that's interesting. Could be that somebody might say, well, I don't have anything else to do, so why not? I've got this book on my shelf, so let me just pick it up and, and let me just thumb through it. Are there better ways, better, uh, more elevated motivations? Certainly, uh, but it's not necessarily that there's anything wrong with that. Uh, could you have someone who, who might be here today because they thought they were coming to Elevate AM to 12 and they got lost? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? What am I doing? What am I doing here? I, I I thought I was going somewhere else. I don't know if you've ever had that experience. Not coming to a prayer class and wanted to go to the movies, but oh, maybe you wanted to go somewhere and and you went to the wrong place. And, and gee, that's interesting. Gee, that's interesting. I, I I think I'll stay. I think I'll stay and I and I'll check it out. It happened, it happened often uh, in the old city where I studied in Jerusalem. I studied in uh, prime location. And there were many tourists who came through the old city, many Jewish tourists, many non-Jewish Jews, and tourists as well. And individuals would invite them in, they'd, they'd, they'd stick their head in and they'd look around and say, gee, this, this is really interesting. I wasn't planning on coming here. So maybe if we ever traveled, we were a tourist, footloose and fancy free, and saw a museum, and we never heard of it before, went in, looked around, it's interesting. Maybe I'll enjoy it. Maybe I'll even learn something because it's a different type of motivation. So the goal over here is, is that or I should say the goal here is, is that an individual may be spending Torah or anything else with certainly detached curiosity, with no end goal of teaching or applying what it is that he or she learns for himself or herself. So an individual might, for example, pick up a book on the diet theory. And might not have any idea or personal commitment whatsoever to actually put it into effect. But they're interested. I'm, I'm interested in knowing it. So, so that's the motivation over here. So the question is: Is that perspective okay? What does what do our rabbis say about that? Because after all, it's not even mentioned in the mission. There's no divine reward given for a person who studies simply out of detached curiosity for a sense of entertainment for the sake of doing it, is that okay or not? Well, there's good news and there's bad news with that perspective. And even the bad news is not really good. The good news is, is that some of it might sink in. So we say it's better to study even for the wrong reason than not to study at all, because who knows? Who knows? You might get something up along the way. I much like using a metaphor that, that we often use and that applies in a number of areas. If you walk in the store that sells flowers, even if you don't buy anything, you'll still come out smelling nice. <laughs> so, so if you if you hang around with people who who are heavily heavily scented, if you will, so that well, happens to me once in a while. Kind of like <laughs> <laughs> you know, with the suspicious eyebrow moving around. So you know, where were you? Where were you? So if you're in a good place, you might pick something up in the process. Um, so, we can see an idea mentioned when it comes in text to the study of Torah, and it says, Vayuhadvarim ha'ele, it states in the Shema, and these words shall be, Al levavecha, you shall place these words on your heart. The rabbis raise the obvious question. First of all, obviously it's speaking metaphorically, because you can't take them and put them on your heart, but the goal one would think that if we're speaking about the importance of Torah entering our heart, so we would think that the Torah would say, you should take the words of Torah and you should place them in your heart. What does it say? Put them on your heart. So the Torah has a very powerful quality of being able to 
be absorbed simply by being placed on the heart. So much like in the same way that an individual might put something on a somewhat porous surface and a certain amount will seep in over a period of time. Our job may be only then to take the turn to place it upon our hearts, to allow us to be exposed to the goodness, to the wholesomeness, to the purity of the ideas of the Torah, and then some of it will seep in. And that's something that can happen by allowing us to be exposed. So that's the good news of an individual who comes and they're just windows up. The bad news is, and again, it's not really bad news, is that on a scale of 1 to 10 in terms of the, the quality of one's motivation, this is about maybe a 1 or a 2 or 3. Pretty low on the hierarchy. And the reason why that said is, is that when it comes to Torah, unlike just about any other form of, of learning or knowledge, the goal of Torah is not to be entertained. This is not the Torah that we study simply for our intellectual entertainment gratification. The goal of Torah is to do. The goal of Judaism is to put it into action. It should be perceived as something that's relevant. And if I don't see the relevance, so that means that I have to look for the relevance. I have to find a teacher who can share the Torah with me in a way that I can take it and sift it to be able to extract the nuggets of, of relevance and, and practicality. I have to look for that in my wisdom and in my learning as well. Constantly saying to myself over the course of anything that I learn, you know, what's this leading to? What, what am I going to be able to take away from this? What's the new understanding? And how can I translate this into, into my life? So whether it be a sermon, whether it be a class, whether it be a lecture, whether it be a book, they have to keep your eyes open optimally to be able to understand that this is not just an intellectual uh, study. Uh, this is based on the Talmud that says, in addition to that idea that I shared with you, that the purpose of wisdom, and that's the word that's used in describing Torah, the purpose of wisdom is to change ourselves and to act properly. And the word wisdom is important because while, of course, you can know a lot about various cultures and, and, uh, and peoples by the number of words and the type of words that they use to describe different concepts, in Judaism and in Hebrew, there are a whole lot of words for various forms of wisdom and knowledge. And the word wisdom here, which we're translating from actually several words in Hebrew, is separate and distinct from philosophy and knowledge. So, so philosophy is something, uh, it's, a, it's, it's wisdom or it's knowledge about life itself, but is not necessarily oriented towards changing my life and teaching me how I can go about doing the things that are important. It doesn't necessarily teach me how to be a better person. It doesn't necessarily teach me how to improve my relationships with others. It doesn't teach me about how to have a greater sense of self-awareness and to understand what I'm here for answer those great existential questions that are important to me as well. So, so the greatness of Torah is not its intellectual content, as impressive as that might be. And there's no doubt about it that the intellectual content of the Torah is awesome. I remember saying many years ago uh, an advertisement in the newspaper for IBM, uh, and it said that it was looking for either uh, people with computer programming experience or experience in learning the Talmud. <laughs> so, so you, 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 learn, you, learn, you, learn, you learn how to think, and you learn how to think in a certain way. But the Torah, then, is not simply something that teaches you how to think, but the Torah has meaning, it has relevance, it provides guidance and inspiration, and as we often state, that the translation of the word Torah itself is Instructions. Instructions. It's a user's manual. It's a human being's user manual for living. So not simply an organized set of facts. Uh, and it's different than geology or biology. You know, Sam Cooke, you know, what was the old song? You know, I don't know much about biology, astronomy, anthropology. And, and unlike maybe the experience that some of us might have had in school uh, way back when, you know, you study hard, you cram. And then as soon as the exam is over, it's completely forgotten. Not that that was 
goal, of course, but that was the experience that many of us may have had when we studied. Um, you don't have to put necessarily the things that you learned that are not coming to effect. Uh, for instance, a famous story that's told about Bertrand Russell. Uh, Bertrand Russell, the famous philosopher and mathematician, uh, who lived somewhat of an exciting lifestyle, to uh, put it in uh, par of terms. So when he was once teaching uh, in the Department of Philosophy, uh, he got called down to the carpet by the head of the department for uh, for some extra extracurricular activities that the, the department and that the university didn't smile upon. And he was teaching an ethics class as well. So the chair of the department said, said Professor Russell, that he said, you know, we, we've become aware that you're doing certain things, and it's well known, and it was in the newspapers. Um, you not only are a professor at our school, but you teach ethics. How can a person who's running around, I think, with someone else's wife or something like that? So, so they say, you're, 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 you teach ethics. You teach ethics. So how, how can a person like you teach ethics? They said, you're, you, you're acting in this way, and it's well known. And presumably, there's something that you admit to. So he had a great answer. So what did he say? So he said, let me ask you a question. He wasn't Jewish, but he answered the question with a question. <laughs> so, so, so he said, let me ask you a question. He said, I used to previously teach in the Department of Mathematics. Was I disqualified from teaching math because I wasn't very well again? <laughs> he said, you don't have to be a parallelogram to teach math, and you don't have to be an ethical person to teach ethics. When he was right, he was right. To, to qual you, do, you, do, you, do, you do not have to have your tzitzes checked <laughs> if you want to be philosophy teacher right you know they don't they don't come in and look at your kitchen to see if you have separate dishes for milk and meat but they don't examine your tax returns to be able to see you know if you're on the up and up if you teach ethics obviously it would be preferable but but that's a world of difference between what torah is so given then that one should have a purpose in the study of one's Torah. Optimally, one should have purpose and approach all things purposefully that we study. Again, even if it's just to be able to relax, we have something more than relaxation and intellectual stimulation. So given that we should have a purpose, so the author of our teaching today, Rabbi Yishkal, offers us two choices. So let's begin and let's take a look at those two choices that of course are choices that are mentioned and highly preferable other than the person auditing the class, who's just auditing, or just auditing, or just perusing the book. So option number one, we refer to it as option number two, really, because there might be an individual who's just, uh, just, just as I said, auditing, is a person who is learning or studying for the sake of teaching. So that's number two. A person is studying, and they have the intent in mind that they're not simply learning it in order to know it but they're learning it in order to teach it. And the second example, or really number three, that an, of a motivation that a person can have is that when they learn, when they study, they always have an eye to, how can I put this into practice? A person who learns for the sake of doing. So which one of the uh, these last two options is better, is more elevated in the opinion of the author of our teaching today, it's clear that a person who studies in order to do is doing something that's better. It's on a higher level than a person who learns in order to teach. However, there is or are several questions that we could ask about that. So let's analyze this a little bit further. Let's study and let's think about this with a little bit of an eye to understand what it is that's being said over here. First of all, doing seems to be more basic and more elementary than teaching. Because in most areas of life, you have to do in order to be able to teach. How do you, how do you learn to be able to teach? You have to do it first. So how could you have an individual who can teach something without doing it? And so we would think then that that the teaching comes only after the doing, so therefore the teaching, which would have the prerequisite of doing, would be on a higher level. Uh, if I want to teach someone how to hit a baseball, 
if I want to teach someone how to play piano, or if I want to teach someone how to be able to speak a foreign language, I have to do that myself, whether I was raised to do it or whether I learned to do it. You can't have a person teach something who he himself or she himself, in most, almost all cases, doesn't know how to do it. Doesn't mean that they need to be an expert, but they certainly have to have some familiarity with the doing itself. So that's the question. It's an obvious question. <clears throat> the second question that we can ask is that somebody who studies to teach, it's described in the Mishnah, is also someone who is studying to do. Because if we're talking about someone who's just studying to teach and saying, well, I'm just studying to be able to learn this, to be able to teach, I have no interest in doing it, that's a person who falls in category number one. That's the first person who we spoke about who's just studying it and they're just studying without any practical application. Even worse, perhaps the person would be. Uh, if we're generous and consistent, uh, and if we're not quite as generous, we might say that the person is a bit hypocritical. Uh, you know, in other words, I want to study. I want to give a class on Torah, and I want to give a class on all the laws of gossip. I'm going to gossip myself. I'm not going to let any of this affect me. Uh, I love talking about other people. I love talking about other people. This is back to the story that Rabbi the priest of medicine remember this, and they all met each other in a hotel lobby in Chicago. And they realized that they were all from St. Louis. So they decided that they would chat among themselves and say, hey, let's tell our secrets. Let's tell our secrets. None of our personal things are telling us ourselves. So, so the priest goes first and he says, he says, well, you know, I'm going to tell you a secret that nobody knows back home. I've got a girlfriend back home. So, ooh, ooh. so the minister says, well, I'd like to share with you a secret that nobody knows back home, that I take some money out of the collection plate every Sunday and put it in my pocket. <laughs> Ooh, ooh. So they turn to the rabbi and they say, Rabbi, well, what's your secret? The rabbi says, well, My secret is I love gossip about other people and I can't wait till I get to the same So, so, so obviously, a person who learns just to teach, whether they're learning and they're learning to teach about gossip or about teaching culture, a person who learns about tobacco, charity, uh, I, I'm not going to give any more than. 0.001% of my income, but it's very interesting, and I want to teach people all about it. Obviously, that's not what we're talking about. So, so if we're talking then about a person who is learning to teach and clearly is learning to both do and teach, why isn't that person superior to the person who's learning to do? So, so these and other questions make it clear that our Category number three, the grand prize winner, the one who gets the gold star, our gold medal winner over here in the mission, the best attitude is that the individual who is learning in order to teach, that the mission says, will receive all of these blessings, including being able to teach. That was not necessarily his or her intent when he or she learned and said, how can I put this into practice? But they're promised that like the person who learned in order to teach, that they will be able to teach. This person didn't learn in order to be able to teach. They learned in order to do. But they're going to become a teacher also, in addition to the additional blessings they receive, is doing, learning to do much more than simply observe the commandments. And this is a bit of a nuance, and it's an important point. But upon this point, Today's lesson, the lesson of the Mishnah hinges. In other words, there can be learning to do, which means I want to learn how to keep culture, and I want to learn how to avoid gossip, and I want to learn how to give charity, and I want to learn how to be able to keep the 613 commandments. Certainly positive. I'm in favor of that. That's not the rabbi. But that's not only what the mission is talking about. What is the Mishnah discussing? The Mishnah is talking about a person who's learning to do, which includes not only learning to do the mitzvahs, but learning to become a different person. Learning to become changed. In other words, doing unto or unto oneself by allowing oneself to be transformed by all of the Torah that they study. And whether they're changed through the performance of the commandments, through the keeping of the mitzvahs, 
or whether they're simply changed and transformed in ways that I hope to describe an individual is committed to doing by allowing themselves to be affected by the power of the Torah that they study. So to elaborate, what this means is, is that if I say, you know, I'm only going to keep 613 mitzvahs and nothing else, and that is the purpose of my study. In other words, I'm going to be or approach Torah in a very utilitarian manner. Tell me what to do, Rabbi. Give me the checklist. Tell me what to do. And I'm going to go through the course of the day. I'm going to see if I can check off as many mitzvahs as possible. It's a wonderful thing to have that attitude. But what the mission is speaking about is, is something deeper than that, something more important. It's talking about being open to the lessons from the Torah that you learn and being prepared, not giving your teacher a book of blank check and being prepared to accept everything sight and sin, but being prepared to be moved, to be affected, to let some of the words penetrate. Not only your psyche, but to penetrate your heart. To allow the words of the Torah, the values, the character traits, the lessons, the purity, the Kedusha, to rest upon your heart with the goal that you're going to let some of the good stuff in and that over a period of time that you will be transformed into a better person. You are studying Torah with the goal of integrating the teachings of the Torah, whether you integrate those teachings through the physical actions or reaching into your pocket or your checkbook time after time after time by writing checks or giving coins and by refraining from gossip, etc. But even the ideas that you hear, you allow those ideas to penetrate you. So as we indicated before, Torah is not an ology. It's not a biology or an astronomy or an anthropology. Technology is an organized scientific method of study. It's a way of thinking of and viewing the world. But the Torah student, the individual who studies Judaism, who studies Torah, wants it to become part of me. I want to not simply act as a better Jew, but I want to become a better Jew. And the way that I will become a better Jew is by having a Jewish personality. When a person <clears throat> studies Torah in this way, when a person allows themselves to be affected by Torah in this way, so you will look at the world differently. But more importantly than looking at the world differently, you look at your interactions with other people differently. And you will make decisions in your relationships and in your personal decisions that will be not simply colored, but informed by the th thought processes that have been affected by not simply the logic of the Torah, but by its kedusha, but by its, by its holiness. You'll understand what makes things tick, and you'll understand what makes people tick. I'll share with you two examples. <clears throat> A friend of mine who I was very close with uh, in yeshiva, uh, one time he had a debate. We had a, an enthusiastic discussion. If you had time to learn one language, one foreign language, would it be better to learn Hebrew or to learn Yiddish, if you had a choice? So, so we batted around back and forth with lots of enthusiastic points in the favor of the language that we support. So we decided, given that we weren't able to come to a resolution, we decided to approach our rabbi. We both had an individual who we looked to our rabbi. So we went to him and we said, Rabbi, Rabbi Nachorowit, currently a teacher in Israel, and he said, so uh, we're having this discussion, we're having this debate, we didn't tell him who said what, about whether Hebrew or Yiddish is a better language to learn. If you have a choice between one or the other, what do you say? So he said, he said, I'm going to tell you I said, I'll share with you my answer. He said, but before I do that, I'm going to tell you who said what. He said, I'm going to tell you why, me, why I said Hebrew. And my friend, he said, I'm going to tell you why Israel said Yiddish. And he knew us so well that he's able to tell what our arguments were as well as the particular perspective that we have. If, 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 if you know a person well enough, you learn how they think. 
learn how to think. You look at certain things, and the study of Torah will affect the way that you think and the way you look at things. Uh, my daughter Sylvia, to show you something personally, uh, just left me a little little card uh, before she left. She was here for about a week and a half or so before. After my wife was gone, she, my wife is in Seattle, and uh, Sylvia Chippy, we refer to her at home, is on her way to New York and Israel. So she sent me a very, mov very moving letter, uh, left me a little letter when she left, so she said the following. She said, Dear Dad, I just wanted to say thank you for everything you've done to help me succeed in college. And she shared with me her gratitude for a few things that she, uh, that she felt that I had done for her. And she said the following. She said, you've never steered me wrong, other than when I was pregnant, I got a loss once. You never steered me wrong, and I feel that I started thinking like you when I'm conflicted about something. And that's probably the best most useful thing that I've learned how to do in college. So if we're very close to a person, if we're very close to a teacher, if we're very close to a mentor, we've probably all had the experience of, of saying, if not consciously, then subconsciously, now what would they say? What would they say? How would they approach it? What would mom say? What would dad say? What would my professor say? What would my mentor say? And if we find that we, if we allow ourselves, or if we're blessed enough to be able to be exposed to a person, we begin to think like them when we look at the world in a little bit of a different way. So, so the study of Torah allows our thought processes, and not just our thought processes, but ourselves to be purified. So <clears throat> it's like the story of the story about the Kasi, the, uh, the individual who went to his Rebbe. And he said, Rebbe, he said, I know you're going to be very proud of me. I've gone through the entire Talmud. I just completed the study of the Talmud, and I've gone through the entirety of the Talmud. So, so the Rebbe said to him, he said, well, that's wonderful. That's certainly a substantial accomplishment. But the real question is not, did you go through the Talmud, but how much of the Talmud went through you? Wow. So... That's the goal. The goal is how much of it does, how much sticks, how much stays within us. Not simply the intellectual or rational decision to say, I want to put this into practice, which of course is important, but how much have I been affected through my immersion and through my involvement in the study of birth. So, <clears throat> So what we find then is, is that the Mishnah tells us that there are two gifts that are given to individuals who learn Torah. And we did say in our introduction, just in, by way of conclusion, that there's an individual who's just sampling things, they just bop in, they pick up a book, they read, and it is positive because an individual ultimately might come to be excited and might come to take their studies more seriously. But for the individual who learns, not simply to learn for the intellectual stimulation, but learns to teach, the mission says that that person will be given divine assistance. That person will be given the gift of being able to be a teacher. If you want to teach, you will be given, when it comes to terror, you will be given by the Almighty the opportunity to find individuals with whom you can share what it is that you've learned. And learning to teach has great benefits. Any of us who have ever had the opportunity to teach, there's individuals who, who were and who are professional teachers know very well the many benefits of teaching. It requires a clarity of concepts and definitions. It requires a much more profound understanding than somebody who's just, just studying. An individual who reads through something and says to himself or herself, well, wait a minute, I'm going to have to teach this, so I have to anticipate the questions that they're going to ask me. And if for no other reason than not wanting to be embarrassed or caught flat-footed, we all know that if we learn something and we have to share it with others, in our own minds, we're going to clarify it much more clearly than if we're just picking something up and dozing off halfway through. Thomas says that an individual can say about himself or herself, I learned much from my teachers, but I even learn more. Even more, I learn from my friends. But most of all, I learn from my students. So most of the great people, certainly in the Torah world, are individuals who reach the highest levels of scholarship 
and they were also teachers. They were heads of yeshivas, they were teachers, and the greatest of our scholars, not coincidentally, also happen to be teachers. You're not going to lose out if you commit yourself to teach, but on the contrary, you only benefit. However, a high level, and this is the final level and the best level, is a person who learns to do. Because the person who learns to do wants more than to understand clearly what it is, what it is that he or she is learning to teach. He or she, as we said, wants to make the Torah part of him or her. They want to become a better person. They want to become a better Jew. And it's not just about going through the motion. It's not just learning how long do I have to wait between eating meat and drinking I mean, drink, eating meat and drinking milk. They want to enter, as we said, their psyche and their heart. And to this person, the mission the author of our teaching today says, you will not only become such a person, but you also become a capable teacher. Now, why will you become a capable capable teacher? And this is the final point that I'll share with you. The reason why a person will become a capable teacher is because of an idea that's expressed in many different Places in the Torah. I'll use the Hebrew phrase and translate it for you. Devarim she yotzin min halev. The Torah says words that come from the heart. Nichnasim min halev onto the heart. And individuals can detect sometimes with crystal clarity the sincerity and the authenticity of a person who speaks the Torah. Of an individual who's talking about anything. That we have our radar and we can tell the individuals who are just talking the talk compared to the individuals whose expression goes are walking the walk. So we might be impressed to a degree by educators in a very general sense who are articulate and they have a sense of humor and they've learned all about the methodology to be able to be effective teachers. But there's nothing that replaces the quality of a person who teaches, especially when it comes to Torah, an individual who is who's honest, a person who's unassuming, and a person who has it in their kishkas, a person who represents the Torah that they're teaching. So when an individual learns not to teach, but to do, I am learning this for myself. I want this and I need this. And I want to learn not only what to do, but what to become, so people will see you in a different light. And they will look at you as a role model, and they will say, wow. Say, this is what the Torah could do. This is what studying Judaism could do. This is something, there's something that's there. And then you will be the most effective teacher of all. Not necessarily an individual who gets before a class, but an individual who will model the behavior of the Torah. And then people will say, well, there's something there. And there's something I want for myself. Very nice to see everyone. Thanks for joining us. I want to wish everyone a happy Hanukkah. Or as we say around here, a happy Hanukkah. Uh, <laughs> Let's uh, let's take a few moments if anyone has any questions or uh, comments before we break for Mincha at 105. So we would ask the gentlemen who are available to stay if you can stick around. Yes, Trudy. Well, uh, what happened to me, as I'm walking around, I started learning as an adult. And I said, I'm going to teach myself. And I started teaching myself. And I was totally very frightened to do so, even on a basic level, to kindergarten, you know, it is a lot. It's, it's but to think that, and, and it caused me to want to um, learn more for myself to practice. And in the bottom line of it all, too, I, I grew more. And setting an example, you, you use the word role model. That was the key for myself to be a role model to my family, to my children, to, you know, others as well. And I think that. Uh, it enlightened myself of the importance of being true to yourself and to act in a Jewish way through your life that it will emulate um, to others. And uh, I, I could say it's, it's a pure blessing to follow those words. Okay, okay thank you for sharing that. Yeah, folks, good to see everyone. Uh, have a wonderful day. Enjoy the nice weather. And uh, we'll see everybody soon again, gentlemen. If you can stick behind, that'll, uh, that'll help.